Protectors of the Suna Suna Protectors of the Suna Okay, alhamdulillah. Um, last week uh, we talked about uh, the birth of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Talked about his names and his nursing, splitting of his chest, and all those kind of things. So we'll get underway with a, a quiz on the last session that we had. Okay, straight to the quiz. In the year 571, in the Christian era, Abraha and his army attempted to destroy the Kaaba. What other major event happened that year? In the year 571, Abraha and his army attempted to destroy the Kaaba. What other major event happened that year? Okay, so getting some answers here, Sister Laley has answered. The major event that changed the world history was a special child was born who would grow to become Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Sister Malun, the Prophet was born during that. Okay, that's good. Okay, so um, this child was born into an ignorant and decadent society at that time. Uh, however, it will be transformed into the most knowledgeable and just society. And Sister Sarah has put our prophet was born in Mecca in year 571. Good answer. And we also talked about last time how he would grow to become a role model for many billions of humans from all over the world later on and his words and actions would be spoken about and studied for many years afterwards and uh, the scholars uh, in agreement that he was born on a Monday on the 12th of the month of Rabi al Awal during the year of the elephant okay Next question, what was the religion of Abraha and his people? What was the religion of Abraha and his people? Okay, Lely has put the religion of Abraha and his people's Christianity. Uh, they were Christians, Sister Malyun and Sister Sarah has put Christians as well. Okay, so there were Christians um, who had ruled over Yemen for a long time. Originally, they were from Adams. They entered into Yemen when the Christian king of Abyssinia sent an army to Yemen. And that was in response to a request to the Roman Emperor to retaliate against the Jewish slaughter of Christians in Yemen, which we talked about in detail before. Next question, Muhammad was also called Ahmad, 
what does Ahmad mean? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was also called Ahmad. What does Ahmad mean? Okay, Sister Sarah, uh, Sister Lady answered the name Ahmad means praiseworthy. Sister Sarah, Ahmad means he praises Allah and it comes from the same root word Hamd. Sister Malun, Ahmad means he praised Allah. Sister Um Ibrahim's family, Ahmad means he praises Allah. And Sister Awa, it means praise Allah. Okay. That's good. So Muhammad uh, means the person who draws praise. So he's praised. And Ahmad means that he praises Allah. So the Prophet وسلم, praises Allah more than anyone else. And therefore, the Prophet's name is as much a title that describes the Prophet's qualities, and it's a name that identifies the Prophet as an individual. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Just throwing in an extra question here, uh, in case we've got any memorizers of the Quran uh, following. Um, this is not on the slides or anything. Does anyone know which surah of the Quran the word Ahmad appears? Okay, in which surah of the Quran does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refer to Muhammad as Ahmad? Do you know which surah that is? Okay, some answers. The, uh, I'm not sure if it occurs more than once, but uh, the most common one I think is well known by is in, uh, it's in sort of soft, the ranks, where um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan al-rajim, wa idh qala Isa ibn Maryam ya bani Israel inni rasulullahi ilaykum musaddiqad lima bayni yadayya min at-tawrati wa mubashiram bi rasul Ya'ti min ba'di ismuhu Ahmad. Okay, it's in ayah number six. And this is talking about when um, Isa, son of Maryam, the son of Mary, uh, said, O children of Israel, indeed I'm a messenger of Allah to you, confirming what came before me of the Torah and bringing good tidings, good news of a messenger to come after me, whose name is Ahmad. Okay, so we'll go on to another question. And what is Muhammad's nickname, Prophet Muhammad's nickname, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Uh, Sister Fatima, your question there, uh, what page and chapter is this on? It's not on a page or a chapter, okay? It's um, it's not from a book, okay? There are good books that you can refer to, though. One of the best books uh, is called The Sealed Nectar. That's, that's probably the best book uh, you can refer to. Uh, which covers all these topics, but um, uh, the material is not from a book. Okay. Yeah, this, the sealed nectar is good because it, it's um, it's got loads of colourful pictures and maps and diagrams and all those kind of things, so it's very interesting. Okay, Sister Sarah has put, his nickname is Al-Amin, meaning faithful and trustworthy. Um, Al-Amin, one of the names that, or descriptions that he was known by, um, but it wasn't actually his nickname. His nickname, as Sister Laili has here, 
is Abu Qasim. Okay. Father of Qasim. All right, question five gives the names uh, for the following relatives of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His father, mother, grandfather. What was his grandfather's position? Okay, there's four parts to the question. Give the names for the following relatives of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His father, mother, grandfather, and what was his grandfather's position? Okay, his father um, should know that one. And um, his grandfather we talked a lot about. All right, Sister Layli, his father, Abdullah, his mother, Amina, grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, and um, he was a leader of Quraysh. Okay, and Sister Malyun has put uh, his father's name Abdullah, his mother's name Amina, grandfather's name Abdul Muttalib, and his grandfather's position, uh, chief leader of Quraysh. Okay, any other answers? Sister Sarah has put um, has put the same answers. Uh, his grandfather Abdul Muttalib, his grandfather took over duties providing pilgrims with water and food and carried on the practices of forefathers with his people and he was the owner of the camels. Yet that's all, all true. Um, but in fact, uh, Quraysh was divided into a number of clans also. Uh, Sister Lely, his grandfather's position was leader among the people and noble person among his tribes. Yeah, so uh, Quraysh was divided, um, you know, into a number of clan clans or tribes as well, and um, one of those clan names was Banu Hashim. Okay, so Abdul Muttalib, he was the leader of um, that part of the Quraysh called Banu Hashim. Okay, so mashallah, good job there on the quiz questions. So number six, name the family tree of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam going back three generations. Name the family tree of the Prophet going back three generations and um, Muhammad Ibn so-and-so, Ibn meaning son of. Okay, Sister Sarah Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim. Sounds pretty good. Sister Malyun has put the same answer. Sister Layli has put the same answer. MashaAllah, very good. Okay, well, good answers there. Go on to question seven. How was Thuwayba involved in raising Muhammad as a baby? How was Thuwayba involved in raising Muhammad as a baby?
Okay, Sister Laley answered, she was the first woman who breastfed the Prophet and was, and she was a slave of Abu Lahab. Uh, Sister Ibrahim Thawaiba was one of the Prophet's first wet nurses or foster mothers and Sister Sarah, she was the first other woman to breastfeed the Prophet. Okay, mashallah, good answers. So she was the first person to breastfeed him after his mother. Her name is Thawaiba and then um, Then there were other uh, foster mothers after her as well. So Um Ayman uh, was also witness of the Prophet. Her name was Baraka al Habashia. Um, then Halima Saadia also accepted to be um, his foster mother and she raised him out uh, away from Makkah. Okay, next question, why did the Arabs send their babies to Bedouin wet nurses or foster mothers? Why did the Arabs send their babies to Bedouin wet nurses? Okay, we did talk about this last session, why the Arabs used to send their babies to Bedouin witnesses. Sister Laili, because the children would be safe from any diseases, commonly afflicted people in the city and children would grow up independent, strong, physically and mentally, and learn pure Arabic language with no slang words that often spoken in the city. Sister Sara, that was the practice. The children who were raised in the desert were at a Safe dis distance from the diseases that commonly afflicted city dwelling people. Also, a child would grow up independent, strong in the desert, and would learn pure Arabic and avoid picking up the slang was spoken in the cities. Okay, Masha, good, uh, good answers there. No need to add to that. On to the next question. What incident happened during Muhammad's stay with Halima Saadia? What incident happened during Muhammad's stay with Halima Saadia? Okay, Sister Sarah's answer, as soon as Halima took the Prophet back to her camp, her breast provided him all the milk that he needed, also enough for her son, so they were able to rest at night. Also, the camels providing so much milk, they would send out goats to graze, they would come back full and would, they would milk them whenever they wanted, while others sighed and the animals were hungry without any milk. Uh, Sister Laili, the incident was that one day, uh, Muhammad was playing with his foster brother and foster brother came rushing and said my mother from Quraysh, uh, my brother from Quraysh and asked what happened to him. He said two men dressed in white came down and knocked him to the ground and they opened his chest and sister Um Ibrahim, angels came and performed surgery on the prophet, opened his chest as a means of protecting him from the shaitan. Okay, so that's good. Um, the angel Jibril came down, opened his chest, 
removed his heart, took out a clot of blood, saying it was a part of Shaitan, washed the heart in Zamzam -zam water and placed it back in his chest. That's the incident that happened I was looking for. And final question, how old was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when his mother died and who took care of him after that? How old was Muhammad when his mother died and who took care of him after that? His sister Sarah, he was six years old and he was taken care of by his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, raised him up. After his grandfather passed away, then uh, he was eight and so on. Since the lady, he was six years old and his grandfather took care of him after that. Yeah, that's correct. He was six years old uh, at that time when his mother died. And um, his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, took care of him. Okay, so mashallah, uh, that's excellent participation in the quiz. Uh, so today we're going to talk more about uh, Prophet Muhammad's life as a child, um, how he worked as a shepherd, uh, and go into some details of how the prophets learned many uh, like personal characteristics by being shepherds. Talk about the Fudul Alliance, a pre-Islamic agreement to stop aggressive behavior, and also his marriage to Khadija. And if you're following along with a, a book, um, these topics are well covered in the sealed nectar. Okay, so on to talking about his youth. Once his mother Amina died, it was Abdul Muttalib, his grandfather, who became guardian and caretaker of the Prophet. Abdul Muttalib loved Muhammad a great deal and preferred him even to his own sons, who were the uncles of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And being in awe of their father, the Prophet's uncles did not dare sit on his carpet. In fact, no, nobody else dared to sit with him on his carpet. And yet Muhammad, though, although his uncles would try to make him sit somewhere else. And we talked, um, we described this um, last week. Uh, it's just a reminder of the story how Abdul Muttalib, he took the Prophet's side in this matter. In fact, he encouraged Muhammad to sit alongside him, seeing goodness in him and sensing that he was going to grow up to do great things. And when an Abdul Muttalib would send Muhammad errand, he would perform it and return home in a short while. But one day, Abdul Muttalib, he sent, to, uh, he sent him to search for stray camels, which delayed his return home. And when the Prophet became very late, Abdul Muttalib, he began to worry a great deal and even felt very sad for he loved his grandson a great deal. And as soon as Muhammad returned with the camels, Abdul Muttalib said to him, Oh, my son, just as a woman does, I have become sad on your own. With sadness that's so extreme, it will never leave me. After two years of his guardianship had passed, Abdul Muttalib, realizing he was dying, he ordered that his son Abu Talib should be the new guardian of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So at the age of eight, again, Muhammad had a new guardian and one who loved almost as much as a grandfather. He worked as a shepherd. Being of noble lineage doesn't guarantee financial stability, a fact that Abu Talib knew all too well. When Muhammad was still young, Abu Talib was going through a financial crisis. He had many mouths to feed and the business wasn't going too well. To help his uncle get through these hard times, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he worked as a shepherd. An authentic, the messenger of 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said a prophet that Allah Ta'ala sent herded sheep at one time or another during his lifetime. And the companion said, and even you? He said, yes. I used to herd sheep with payment from the people of Makkah. Working as a shepherd allowed the prophet to work in peace and quiet, to enjoy the beauty of the desert, and to contemplate the wonders and the beauty of Allah Ta'ala's creation. Through his work as a shepherd, the prophet picked up and developed many wonderful qualities. Qualities the prophet needed later to lead his nation. And the prophets learn many qualities by being shepherds. Firstly, responsibility. The most important lesson they learned was responsibility, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. And Ibn Yamar radiallahu anhu anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called Kurdukum ra'in wa kurdukum mas'oonun an ra'iyati. You are all shepherds and you are all responsible for your herds. For example, the Imam is responsible for the Muslims in his community. The husband is responsible for his household and so on. Everyone is responsible for someone or something. A shepherd usually works for somebody else who owns the flock. So they are hired by somebody else, meaning that shepherds are answerable to him. So a shepherd cannot just go back to the owner and say, for example, uh, sorry about that, but I just lost one of your sheep. It doesn't matter what the sheep did. The shepherd is responsible, even if it isn't his fault, regardless of whether the sheep obey or not, the shepherd is responsible. So it's a very important lesson for the leader. You're responsible for your flock. And the prophets of Allah will one day be accountable for their people. It also teaches them patience. A shepherd is busy taking care of his flock sunrise till sunset. Since sheep take so long to graze, a shepherd needs to be very patient in dealing with his flock. Likewise, a leader also has to be patient with his people for different reasons. Taking sheep out to graze takes time. The shepherd, uh, the sheep, they take their own time. So they are slow. So the shepherd, he has to wait. Sometimes the sheep might start playing or they may, may start fighting amongst each other. But the shepherd has to be patient. A shepherd can't really just go to the, up to them and say, come on, guys, we're getting late. Sheep take their own time. So the prophets learn to be very patient with their people. And look at what Prophet Musa السلام, had to go with us. He had to go through with his people. It was pretty unbearable. And then he was a shepherd for 10 years, which is longer than any other prophet. When he left Egypt and he got married, Prophet Shu'aib told Musa to work for him for 10 years as a shepherd. Prophet Nuh, Prophet Nuh spent 950 years in da'wah and still he was patient with the people. He tried every different way. He tried publicly to invite them. He tried privately, nighttime, daytime, every way. He tried every way and they just rejected his message. also teaches them protection by being a shepherd. The shepherd protects his flock from various dangers. There are wolves and other beasts and even diseases, and shepherds continuously ensure there are no dangers to the flock. The prophets of Allah to Allah tried to protect their people. They protected them from physical and psychological dangers. Sheep are also close to the ground and their eyesight is very limited, but a human Standing tall has a much better view, so the shepherd can detect danger long before the sheep will. It's the same with the prophets and their people. The prophets warn of dangers long before the dangers approach their people. They have the clearest vision and the longest view know what's good for their people. And the analogy of prophets and people is like someone sitting next to a fire at night and all of these insects get attracted to the fire thinking it's light. And they don't know that if they go near it, it will burn them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the analogy of me and you is like a man who started a fire. The light of the fire attracts the moths and the grasshoppers which fall into it. The man tried to keep them away, but they overcame him and jumped into it. I'm catching a hold of your clothing to save you from fire, but you slip away from my hands. The prophet sees the danger and we don't. The prophet, uh, to protect the sheep, the 
shepherd, he might hit some of the animals, for example, not because he wants to hurt them, but to save them. So whenever a messenger of Allah stands up and gives a staunch warning, it's not because they're rude or insensitive, but it's because they care for their people. Being a shepherd also teaches simplicity. A shepherd lives a very simple life. He cannot have all of the modern conveniences with him in the desert. Even if he's rich, he cannot carry all of these kind of things out with him in the desert while he's shipping. His possessions need to be small and light so he can easily pack up and move camp and move from place to place and be able to fully take care of the animals. The shepherd also eats very simple food and lives in simple accommodation. Also, it teaches them to get accustomed to different environments. It could be scorching heat, rainy and windy or freezing cold. The shepherd is the last to take cover and he needs to protect his flock first. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would travel a lot due to dawah and battle, have to face, uh, face up to all kinds of different climates. Being a shepherd also brings people uh, closer to the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It takes you out of the fake material world because you're out in the desert or whatever with the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in other words, close to nature. And the modern lives that we lead, it could leave some harmful scars on our hearts and can heavily influence our way of thinking. Living in the superficial world, lies and deception become the norm as long as you don't get caught. In the urban lifestyle, everything is against the natural, natural disposition of our creation. We were created from earth and life in concrete and steel towers is keeping us away from contemplating on the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the Quran, there are so many references to the many creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sun, moon, stars, heavens, rivers, plants, animals, insects, clouds, and rain, and so on. And all of this is in the Quran. But why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention all of these? Because his creation is a mirror of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we want to learn about the attributes of Allah, we should look at his creation. The prophets of Allah were thus given time to contemplate over Allah to Allah's creation by, by being closely exposed to it, not cut off from it in concrete towers, artificial heat, artificial light, and course so-called fresh food. And these are some of the lessons the prophets learned by being shepherds. But how come they all looked after sheep? Why not, for example, um, camels or horses, cows, and other animals like that. Sheep are very weak animals, much weaker than camels or cows. Therefore, they need more care and protection. Because all of this weakness, um, because of all of this weakness, they could easily fall prey, natural predators. And when the prophet wanted to learn, uh, wanted to warn us about shaitan, uh, he called on his experience and he said, the shaitan is the wolf of man, like the wolf of sheep takes the stray sheep and the one that wanders far. Beware of division and adhere to the jama'ah, the majority group of the Muslims. So the prophet learned by being a shepherd that the wolf only attacks the sheep that strayed. It doesn't attack the main flock. We are as weak as these sheep when it comes to shaitan. Shaitan can tempt us and attack us. Also, there's another important consideration. We are strongly influenced by the environment that we live in. Shepherds of sheep are different to shepherds of camels or any other animal. Why? Because they're dealing with a very different animal. Sheep tend to be very passive animals and they are weak. So the shepherd of sheep, he learns to become merciful and kind with them. Sheep are very fragile animals. You can't be harsh with sheep. So the prophets of Allah, they learn to be compassionate with their followers. But when it comes to camels, for example, camels tend to be arrogant animals. So they're shepherds, they cannot be soft with them, otherwise they can take advantage of you. With a camel, you need to meet that arrogance with strength. So that makes the shepherds of camels tough and they could be rude. Your career, your profession, your trade, 
all of these have a direct influence on your behavior and your character. Teachers, for example, make good parents as they develop parenting skills as a part of their careers. As Muslims, we need to be careful what kind of work we do, bearing in mind that your work will influence your behavior and treatment of those around you. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he was one of the classical uh, scholars of Islam, and uh, he wrote the most uh, famous commentary on uh, the book Hadith al-Sahih al-Bukhari. And there are other countries, but um, none, of, none of them were as well known as Fatul Bari by Ibn Hajar. So he's written a short um, commentary on this hadith of the wolf devouring the lone sheep. So he says the wisdom behind having the prophets as shepherds before prophethood is that they may become skilled in herding a flock as they will be responsible for their respective nations in the future. In herding, one attains forbearance, mercy, and instills patience. For when a shepherd is obliged to gather his flock and herd it from one area to another at once, knowing the traits of all of them, and all the while protecting the flock from predators, he's thus attained skills necessary to lead a nation and protect it from its enemies, both internal and external. And thus the prophets learned patience when leading their people and attained an understanding of the different natures of people. They learned to show kindness to the weak and steadfastness with the dominant, the reasons for which Allah Ta'ala had chosen sheep for the prophets as opposed to communal cows or camels, is that they are animals that are weak and need extra guidance and attention. Sheep are more difficult to maintain as a flock because of their tendency to go astray and wander away. And this is similar to human traits within a society. And it's the divine wisdom of, of Allah Ta'ala to train these prophets accordingly. And the mentioning by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of these humble traits shared by all prophets attests to his humility to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And another one of the scholars states, this faith excels through the courageous, the intelligent, and those who are just. And one cannot attain, uh, one cannot encompass it except by distancing himself from lowly character. It's therefore incumbent upon us as Muslims to take on the pure characteristics embodied in humanity's natural disposition. And this was the example sought by the early Khalifa, Omar ibn al-Khattab, when he pleaded with his peace pool, he pleaded with his people to toughen up and learn how to ride horses. He feared for his people the love of this life and adopting shameful characteristics. It doesn't mean we have to abandon urban living in order to achieve these objectives, but it does mean that one should abandon those things in life that will turn them away from the message of Islam. So this learned person, he's commenting on uh, commenting on the Prophet وسلم, living as a shepherd in the desert and how the messenger was brought up in the desert in the early years of his life with Halima Sa'diya and his foster brothers and sisters. And he gave us the example of Umar when he was the Khalifa. He had knowledge and ability to get the best of what this world could offer, the wealth, possessions, everything. But he still chose to live a simple life and he was warning the Muslims by telling them to toughen up. This was because the message at times, it demands a believer to go through some difficult situations and a believer should be ready for that. And da'wah is one aspect of that message. A da'i cannot be sincere and wholeheartedly involved in da'wah if he patience and be willing to get involved in situations that might be difficult. The next topic here, the Fudul Alliance, uh, and this is the last section of about three slides before we finish off today. Um, this topic is very well covered in that book, um, The Seal Nectar, if you want to refer to that. Um, so this is the next important event um, that happened during the early years of the Messenger of Allah, and uh, this was a pact called the Fudul Alliance. The story behind this is that there was a man who came from a place called Zubaid in Yemen to do business in Mecca. 
his merchandise was taken by a man called Al As bin Wa'il, who promised to pay him back. He was going to sell the merchandise and pay him back. Al As, after a while, refused to pay this man. So, really, he was taking advantage of the fact that the man was a foreigner. Al As expected this man to just walk away, but the man stood up for his rights. He went to a public place in Makkah and he started calling the people of the Quraysh. And he was telling them, I've been oppressed in your land. Of all of you people who will stand up for my rights, will you allow them to happen in your land? So he made some very emotional statements. So some of the clans of Quraysh, they decided to meet together to bring about an agreement on protecting the rights weak in Makkah. One of these families was the family of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And at that time, he was a young boy, but he said, my uncles took me with them to attend this meeting. And the meeting was in the house of a man called Abdullah bin Jad'an. And it was a symbolic thing to hold this meeting in his house because he was a very generous man. And he was a person who would stand up for people's rights. They wanted to honor him by holding the meeting in his house. So they made an agreement that they would all stand together to protect the rights of the oppressed. And this happened before the prophethood. So it was a pact between idolaters. The Prophet wasallam said, I witnessed in the house of Abdullah bin Jadan a pact that I wouldn't have exchanged for the choicest herd. And if it had been suggested after Islam, I would have responded positively to it. So Muhammad وسلم, would have agreed to such a pact that it formed after Islam, even if it was between disbelievers. And there's a, a lesson to learn from this, that Muslims should stand for what is right, no matter what, and stand up for the rights of the needy and the oppressed. And an incident happened later, decades after the death of Muhammad وسلم, and the matter was between these two men, al Hussein bin Ali bin Abi Talib and Al-Walid bin Utba bin Abi Sufyan, who was the governor of Medina at that time. Because Al-Walid was the governor, he took advantage of his position. And he took away some property that belonged to al Hussein. al Hussein went to Al-Walid and said, either you give me back what belongs to me, otherwise I'm going to walk into the masjid and invite the people to the alliance of al Fudul. I will remind them of the alliance of al Fudul. Now, Abdullah bin Zubair was with Al-Walid at the time, and he said, and I too swear by Allah that if he does invoke it, I'll draw out my sword and stand there with him until he gets his justice or we'll die together. Later on, some other people heard of this, and Al-Walid realized that it could be quite dangerous, so he gave back what belonged to Hussein. And the reason why this is mentioned is to show that the Muslims would not stand by and just let somebody be wronged like that. Here you have to be people under a particular leader and Al-Walid bin um, like like him, nevertheless, these people, they stood up against their leader to stand up for what was right. And another of the people of knowledge made a comment and he said this pact shows that no matter how dark night becomes and how oppressive dictators become, noble characteristics will still remain in certain people who stand up for justice and albir or righteousness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made cooperation and enjoy good an obligation upon the Muslims, which he has called to, for example, in this verse of Surah Ma'ida. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وتعاونوا على البر والتقوى ولا تعاونوا على الإثم والعدوان واتقوا الله إن الله شديد العقاب and cooperate in righteousness and piety but do not cooperate in sin and aggression and fear Allah Taala indeed Allah is severe in penalty so for a group of Muslims to enter into a treaty or a contract such as the example uh, described is made permissible because it's only a reinforcement of an Islamic obligation. This is different. Um, however, um, 
this by definition must be different to the situation of Masjid Bara, uh, and this story is told in Surah at Tawbah, when the hypocrites, they built a masjid in opposition to the Prophet and his companions, and this was clearly a case where cooperation was twisted into a strategy to exclude the Muslims. And uh, we're going to go into more detail in, about that in the in the Tajweed class in the next week or two. As for the Muslims contacting people of other faiths in order to r remove oppression or face an oppressor, it becomes permissible for them if there is in it the welfare for Islam and Muslims in the present and future. And the basis for this is essentially the Prophet's willingness to answer the call of the Alliance of Fudul even after Islam. The Prophet's married to uh, marriage to Khadija, both her previous husbands having married. Khadija bint Khawailid was a widow, and she was known for her noble character, and the people of the Quraysh would call her the pure and chaste one. She was also quite wealthy, and she would engage men to do business on her behalf. After she heard about the truthfulness and trustworthiness of Muhammad, she proposed that he do business for her in Asham, promising to give him more than she gave to any other man who did business for her. Muhammad وسلم, agreed and left Makkah in the company of Maysara, Khadija's servant. When Muhammad reached Asham, he sold the merchandise he had with him and the proceeds uh, he used to purchase other merchandise. When all was said and done, he made a lot of profit for Khadija radiallahu anha, and she felt that her wealth was, was blessed then, uh, even more than before. Other than the commission he earned, the Prophet benefited greatly from the journey. He was headed towards uh, the north, and so he passed by Medina, the city to which he would later migrate and make the stronghold of his nation. He also passed by many lands throughout which Islam was soon to spread. For the knowledge he gained from the journey was certainly of value to him later in life. Also, his trip, uh, this trip led to the marriage between him and Khadija radiallahu anha. Throughout the trip, Mesir witnessed the wonderful character, nobility, and truthfulness of Muhammad. And in addition to that, Khadija experienced unprecedented blessings in her wealth. Based upon these reasons, she had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with her close friend Nafisa bint Munabba about her, uh, told her about the positive feelings that she had towards Muhammad. Nafisa went to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and proposed to him on Khadija's behalf. Um, Muhammad was pleased with the proposal, but nonetheless, first he went to his uncles to seek their advice. They all agreed that he should marry her, for she was the noblest woman among the Quraysh. And ever since her last husband had died, almost every Makkan chieftain proposed to her, but she refused all of them. And so shortly thereafter, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married her. She was the first woman that he married and didn't he didn't marry any other woman until after she had died. She gave birth to two of the Prophet's sons and four daughters. The two sons were Al Qasim and Abdullah. This is how I get the get, got the name Abu Qasim. Abdullah was also named uh, known by the names of At Tahir and At Tayyib. Around the age uh, that he was able to um to ride an animal al qasim died as for abdullah he died as a child before the beginning of his father's prophethood prophet's daughters were zainab ruqayya um kulthum and fatima may allah be pleased with them all they all embraced islam married and migrated to al madina and when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam married khadija radiallahu anha he was 25 years of age and he was 40. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Okay, so we'll um, stop at that point and in the next session um, we'll go into more details uh, about his marriage to Khadija and lessons that we can learn from this marriage and that'll be Monday, Tuesday, that'll be uh, Wednesday session, okay, inshallah.
Okay, if you've got any questions on today's uh, material, uh, you can ask questions. You're welcome.